Hello everyone. Welcome to Adapting Practice to a Pandemic, Focus on Home Dialysis and Kidney Transplantation. I'm Krista Lentine from St. Louis University, and I'm delighted to serve as co-moderator for this session, along with Dr. Jeffrey Pearl from the University of Toronto. We have an excellent program for you today, including five speakers who share their insights and expertise in adapting and optimizing kidney patient care in response to the pandemic. We will begin with consideration of increasing home dialysis utilization. Is COVID-19 a Catalyst for Change? By Dr. Edwina Brown from the Imperial College Kidney and Transplant Center in London, United Kingdom. Then Dr. Susie Liu will discuss telemedicine and home dialysis, real virtual care opportunities. Dr. Liu is a home dialysis and telehealth expert at George Washington University in Washington, DC. Dr. Sumit Mohan from Columbia University in New York will share management of the kidney transplant recipient, the known unknowns. And the experience of Dr. Mohan and his colleagues caring for transplant patients during the peak of the pandemic has yielded a number of high impact publications to date. Today, he will share insights with regard to treatment of acute infection in this population, immunosuppression management, and managing transplant recipients as outpatients during the pandemic. Next, Dr. Emily Blumberg from the University of Pennsylvania will discuss safe living post-transplant in the COVID-19 era. Dr. Blumberg is a transplant infectious disease specialist and has been instrumental in providing guidance to professionals and patients through leadership of white papers and webcasts since the onset of the pandemic. And finally, Ms. Glenda Roberts will provide an insightful perspective on adapting to the pandemic from the patient's voice. Ms. Roberts serves as the Director of External Relations and Patient Engagement at the University of Washington Kidney Research Institute. After the presentations, please stay tuned for a valuable recap of highlights framed by Dr. Jeffrey Pearl. Dr. Pearl and I have had the privilege of serving as members of the ASN COVID-19 response team. And please note that additional resources related to these topics are available online at the ASN COVID-19 Toolkit, which continues to be updated with new information. So thank you very much for your time and engagement in this virtual program. Hello, um, I'm Edwina Brown from London, and I would like to thank the organizers um, of this year's ASN um, to, uh, who have asked me to talk about increasing home dialysis utilization um, in this time of the COVID pandemic. These are my disclosures, and I must admit to another disclosure, uh, much of this lecture is based on a paper I've recently published um, with Jeff Pearl um, in Jason. There are of course numerous articles um, discussing the future after the pandemic um, and what we all hope that we're going to be on the right in the green sunny pastures. So what this talk is going to cover is um, why is there des a desire to increase home dialysis? This of course was happening pre-COVID uh, and has this been accelerated post-COVID? Um, are the barriers um, to home dialysis the same? Um, and then I will finish with my own personal experience and reflection. So pre-COVID, uh, as many of you will remember, last year at the ASN, there were many talks about trying to increase home dialysis in the US. There is a lot of evidence that many people want to have dialysis at home, approximately 50% do if given unbiased education and choice. There are many economic advantages, uh, both in high income and low income countries uh, for home dialysis. In an aging population, PD is often less stressful and certainly avoids the need for transport 
um, to hemodialysis centers. And in the US, as we discussed last year, um, there have been um, specific initiatives such as the ESKD prospective payment system and the executive order on advancing Ameri American kidney health. However, these have not always been successful uh, and there are many barriers against home dialysis. Reimbursement in private healthcare systems often favors in-center hemodialysis. Late presentation with ESKD uh, and or low engagement with pre-dialysis education means that there's not time to educate people starting on dialysis about what home dialysis involves um, and whether this would be the optimal management for them. Older people often need assisted PD, which is uh, not universally available and is not available in the US. And there's a huge need to train um, all members of the healthcare team um, in how to do peritoneal dialysis. So what's changed? Well, the big change um, with COVID is the patient perspective. Um, I certainly have um, patients um, both uh, in my advanced kidney disease clinic and those on peritoneal dialysis who are absolutely petrified of going out. Um, to the extent I had one lady who just would allow our nurse um, to visit her at home and she stuck her door out, her arm out through the door um, so he could take a blood test, but she would not come out herself. So the big advantage of home dialysis that there's, is that there's no mixing with patients or staff in the hemodialysis unit. You don't need transport. Um, a lot of patients do not have their own cars and are therefore dependent on public or hospital supplied transport. And there is increasing methods of remote monitoring um, for PD patients so that visits to healthcare are minimized. From the healthcare perspective, there's a lower risk of COVID um, in people who stay in the community. Uh, there is, uh, has been some pressure on hemodialysis numbers which need to be reduced because of the needs for social distancing in units, um, in waiting areas and in hospital provided transport. And there are, are of course increased costs for hemodialysis related to the needs for personal protection equipment. So the, there is now uh, significant evidence that there is considerably less um, COVID in people on PD than on hemodialysis. In the UK, by the end of April, 9% of patients on hemodialysis um, compared to 3% on PD had acquired COVID. And the rates of COVID are even higher in urban areas. Um, in a recent publication of three centres from South London, almost 13% of patients um, on hemodialysis developed COVID compared to 4% on PD. Non-white British and diabetic patients um, were both predictors of acquiring COVID. And there's a high case fatality of around um, 23%. In Ontario, uh, there, the prevalence was much lower, um, but still higher in hemodialysis compared to PD. Um, and this reflects the much lower prevalence of COVID in the community. Um, compared to what we had in urban centres in the UK. But again, there was a high mortality of 27%. So patients on dialysis uh, have high mortality, a high risk from COVID, and therefore have every right um, to be anxious about going into healthcare settings. So what about barriers to PD post-COVID and have these changed? Well, the standard ones um, are still there. We need better pre-dialysis education. We need to educate healthcare staff. We need pathways to PD access. Uh, we still need assisted PD requirements and community support for older patients. The barriers that COVID have, uh, has thrown up are really based on the fact that we need 
virtual education for patients and healthcare staff, and this all needs to be developed. Uh, we need to develop remote monitoring of patients. Um, laparoscopy at the beginning of the COVID crisis in many centers was deemed aerosol generating and in units uh, which only did laparoscopic PD catheter insertions, uh, this obviously caused problems. So one has to develop um, access to percutaneous PD catheters. One also needs to develop COVID protective pathways, find supply of PPE for the PD assistance in the community. And if numbers of patients do go up, one needs to think of the pressure on healthcare staff with a sudden increase in numbers um, and how uh, the healthcare staff can be supported. So in our article, um, Jeff Pearl and I came up with various strategies that are needed to increase PD utilization. And I will go through these one by one um, when I'm thinking about what we did in our own unit. So the first thing to say about our own unit is that uh, there was a, a really major outbreak of COVID in the hemodialysis um, centres. We practice in West London, which is a high um, rate of ethnic minorities, certain predominantly South Asian and Afro-Caribbean, uh, and a large number of patients in very low socioeconomic groups. We have always been predominantly hemodialysis and the units are often overcrowded uh, with uh, many people in waiting rooms and many patients dependent on hospital provided transport. So as you can see from this figure here taken from the paper that was published um, in Jason, you can see that about 20% of our patients on hemodialysis acquired COVID. So 300 had acquired COVID by the end um, of April. With um, the mortality of around 25% that has been noted elsewhere. And at the same time as patients getting COVID, as you can see in the bottom part of the figure, um, the dialysis nurses also acquired COVID in large numbers and this caused major problems um, in terms of staffing. Um, some of the nurses were very sick, some required ITU admissions, but fortunately none died. So what's happened afterwards? Well, as you can see in, in this graph here, um, we already had a steady um, growth of PD over um, the years, this goes back to May 16, with a leveling off of um, around about 150 patients over the 2019 into early 2020. And then after March, there's been a huge increase in the number of patients. The flattening off um, at the end reflects when the transplant list was reopened um, and uh, about four of the PD patients rapidly got transplants. And, um, but since then, our numbers have climbed further and will be off the scale. So which of these strategies that we mentioned in our paper have we used to be able to uh, initiate and maintain this growth of patients on PD? So in terms of patient education, the, there was an agreement with um, my nephrology colleagues that PD should be the first choice given the pressures on hemodialysis. An advanced kidney care specialist nurse was moved into the home therapies unit to discuss dialysis options um, with patients uh, and discuss um, the advantages of PD. And um, at the same time, the advanced kidney care team um, have been developing virtual education links on our website and have now developed live webinars, um, which have proved to be very popular with the patients. We've also been actively training our nephrology trainees. Um, one always attends my telephone clinic um, and is given patients to phone. 
Uh, we've developed local virtual teaching sessions um, and we're now developing recorded lectures for national teaching um, in, in the UK. We were fortunate for PD access um, that we already had a policy of percutaneous catheter insertion for first uncomplicated catheters and around about 60% of our first catheters are inserted percutaneously. Um, and I have three uh, nephrology colleagues um, who do this. At the peak of the epidemic, like elsewhere, there was a ban on laparoscopic surgery, um, but this was rapidly reversed. Um, we then found that there was no routine surgery in the hospital um, and PD catheter insertion and PD related surgery were deemed the second most urgent procedures after tracheostomy to avoid hemodialysis starts. So we had no problems in getting um, operating slots um, for PD catheter insertions. We have also developed a COVID protected pathway in a local private hospital um, where we've done a weekly list um, for routine catheters. Urgent start PD again already existed, but um, numbers tended to be quite low taking up this option. Um, there's been an increased number of patients presenting late uh, and needing urgent dialysis, partly because of, of patients not having blood tests in, in low clearance clinics and uh, not engaging with standard medical care during the peak of crisis. Uh, we've enabled urgent PD assessments, urgent um, catheter insertions by whatever technique is needed. Um, and if needed, we can do low volume APD on both the wards and in, as outpatients in the PD unit. So what about the prescription at the start of PD? Uh, obviously starting so many patients, um, our numbers went from three to four a month up to eight to 10. Uh, requires um, a lot of nurse time for training. Training on to CAPD is, is shorter than for APD and there was also a shortage of APD machines in the UK as they were being reserved for AKI in ICUs um, and for patients who really needed APD for clearance. We have always used incremental prescriptions because we find that, that this um, in, enables uh, patients to, uh, to um, really accept PD more willingly. Um, and our standard regimes are three exchanges, um, six days a week, or two exchanges, five to six days a week, if, if it's predominantly fluid overload or a frail older person. We, again, we have always had assisted PD, at least for the, our program started way back in 2005. Uh, it's essential for broadening access to and maintaining people on PD. Um, we have two assisted programs, APD and CAPD, um, using two exchanges. Um, technicians have all been supplied with appropriate PPE um, as they do go from household to household. Um, and we've successfully done this in nursing homes um, during the COVID crisis with support from the community PD team uh, and doing remote medical reviews and advanced care planning um, meetings using Zoom. So as elsewhere, there's been an increased use of, of telemedicine um, to minimize healthcare visits uh, uh, we've been doing phone and video consultations, patients send in photos of exit sites. We remotely monitor cycler performance, um, though this unfortunately is not available for CAPD. Um, and we can set up calls to include family members. And of course, there are challenges with people who do not speak English or have cognitive impairment. We've had to reevaluate PD quality metrics um, and fortunately, the ISPD practice recommendations for prescribing high quality goal directed PD were published just before um, the onset of the COVID epidemic. I'm not going to go through these in depth, but uh, this guideline does make it um, clear 
that one does not need a random target of Katie over V and one needs a much more global overview to uh, decide um, on what the prescription should be and whether it should be increased or not. We've had to reevaluate the frequency of consultations and blood tests. We tend to see people every couple of months. We're not doing PET tests and we certainly didn't collect clearance tests during the peak of the epidemic. So is this a blip or long-term impact? It's too early to tell. We're just facing um, a second wave of COVID um, in the UK and in Europe. Um, so the pressure to keep people on PD is still there. And hopefully we are going to be turning to the right um, with this not being a blip, but this um, becomes embedded in our practice um, and pastures will be green and bright for PD. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I'd like to thank ASN for inviting me to speak during Kidney Week 2020. I'd like to thank the moderators for their introduction. The title of my presentation is Telemedicine and Home Dialysis, Virtual Care, Real Opportunities. My disclosures are that I am a member of the ASN Quality Committee and ASN COVID-19 Home Dialysis Subcommittee. The objectives of this presentation are to review telehealth regulatory changes under the public health emergency, to review the features of an audiovisual platform, to describe a clinic visit with an interdisciplinary approach, to describe a no-touch physical examination, and to explore future aspects of telehealth. The COVID-19 pandemic required us to practice social distancing, decrease patient and staff exposure to SARS-CoV-2 infection, and to continue to provide care to patients. The use of telehealth allowed us to do this. For some time, Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries were able to use telehealth if they lived in a rural area, namely counties outside of the metropolitan statistical area, and that the originating site where the patient is located was in a hospital, clinic, or doctor's office. The originating site of home and dialysis unit was clearly not permitted. Due to the geographic and originating site restrictions, telehealth was limited. In 2018, Congress passed the Bipartisan Budget Act, which allowed home dialysis patients to elect telehealth. Starting January 1st, 2019, home dialysis patients could elect telehealth after three monthly face-to-face -face visits then with one in-person visit every three months. An audiovisual interaction was required, home was an originating site, and there was no geographic restriction. The uptake of telehealth was not robust as many clinicians and patients were not aware of this act. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the president declared a public health emergency. Under the public health emergency, telehealth was permitted. The originating sites included the home, the dialysis unit, and without geographic restrictions. Clinicians could see patients across state lines as many states waive state licensure as long as a provider held an active license. Clinicians could bill for services across state lines. Clinicians could deliver care to both established and new patients. The three monthly face-to-face -face visits by home dialysis patients to establish care was no longer needed. According to the regulations, HHS will not conduct audits to ensure that such a prior relationship existed for claims submitted during this public health emergency.
The public health emergency also allowed non-HIPAA compliant platforms, reimbursement for audio only visits and payment for televisits equal to in-person visits. Other insurance plans followed CMS's lead. The audiovisual component of a telehealth requires a platform. When considering a platform, consider the cost, scalability, technical support, features that the platform could perform, such as share screen during a video conferencing, self-scheduling, payment collection, physician notification, and how patients are invited, either by text message or email, and security to prevent virus and cyber attacks. The platform needs to meet the needs of the users, in this case, patients, clinicians, nurses, social workers, dietitians, schedulers, and billing staff. The platform should be available on phone, tablets, and or computer, and consider connecting the platform to the electronic health record so that schedulers and billing staff can perform their job. Basically, keep it simple. Each additional feature adds complexity and cost to the platform. Most large practices and dialysis units provide the platform for um, the home dialysis team. In performing a telemedicine visit, access to the internet and adequate bandwidth is required. The nurses help the patient load the um, app for the platform on their device and show them how to use it. The clinician needs access to the electronic health record. To document findings, it is good practice to document whether the interaction was audiovisual or audio only, the participants involved, and the location of the participants. Labs may be reviewed and documented, and prescriptions may be e-prescribed. The nurses schedule the appointment and invite the doctors and the patient. To make the visit more efficient and time efficient, the nurses may obtain vital signs, reconcile medications, and upload flow sheets and or remote monitoring information before the telemedicine visit. The telemedicine visit requires a physical exam without touching the patient. The physical exam is based on observations. Document only those items that can be and are actually visualized. Some findings require the patient to elicit it by tapping, squeezing, or pressing. The home dialysis physical exam focuses on volume status and the dialysis access. Many findings are observational and can be documented. Ask the patient to press on their abdomen to demonstrate tenderness or suprapubic tenderness. Ask the patient to tap on their back to elicit costovertebral angle tenderness. Ask the patient to squeeze their muscles to elicit tenderness. And ask the patient to use one finger to press on the shin bone to demonstrate leg swelling. The interdisciplinary team joins the monthly telehealth visit. Areas for discussion are based on patient input, physical examination, laboratory results, and dialysis flow sheet information. Areas for discussion include the patient's general health, 
patient's dialysis access, blood pressure and fluid management, dialysis treatment adherence and adequacy, nutritional status, anemia and mineral bone metabolism management, transplant status, medication reconciliation, and psychosocial issues. I was an early adopter of telehealth. The patients were invited and they used their phone to access the platform. The nurses scheduled the appointment and the interdisciplinary team joined using their laptop. I joined the platform using my laptop. I had the dialysis unit electronic health record on my tablet. I had my practice um, electronic health record for e-prescribing. I also had a Word document that listed all the patient's medication and dialysis treatment plan. I called this the reminder sheet and any changes that were made during the visit was highlighted. At the end of the visit, I emailed the patient and the dialysis nurse the reminder sheet. This way, the patient had a document showing the changes and the nurses took the changes as orders. Challenges remain with telehealth. First, users who lack internet access or device emphasize health disparities. Two, family members and care partners may assist as clinical presenters during the visit. However, teenagers and young adults complain of lack of privacy and the family members also often report unfavorable behavior and activity. If a language barrier exists, family members may act as interpreters or an interpreter may be found, must be found. I'd like to share with you the perspectives of the patients and the interdisciplinary team regarding telehealth. The patients do not have to travel to the dialysis unit, and there is cost savings in time and transportation to the dialysis unit. They do not need to take time away from work, school, or home activities. This is especially important in pediatric cases as the child needs to be accompanied by a parent to the visit. The parent needs to take time away from work or home and the parent that cannot attend misses out on the visit. The patients miss the uh, in-person visits with the interdisciplinary team and privacy, internet, and device issues have been brought up. The nurses express better patient oversight and are able to continue to provide care remotely. They noted a change in workflow due to the influx of remote monitoring data. This provides opportunity for innovation in nursing care and opportunities to recruit and retain nurses who may be interested in working from home. The nurses did miss the in-person visit interaction and the hands-on experience. They noticed more work in setting up the appointments and setting up home medication delivery. They also noted that more activities and procedures needed to be performed during the inpatient visit. And this may be overwhelming adulting uh, for some nurses initially, but they quickly adopted. The dietitians continued to provide nutritional counseling. They were able to assess the home environment and family members were more likely to participate. For some patients, their eating habits were changed due to food insecurity. And it was difficult for the dietitian to provide information on paper and therefore they were directing pa patients to obtain information from the internet. They missed the in-person interaction and frequently they missed the opportunity in giving out nutritional samples. The social workers continued to counsel and educate patients. They provided social 
psychosocial support during the stressful time. It was easier for family members to participate. The social workers were able to provide insurance update and information due to changes in job status. It was difficult for them to fill complete forms that needed patient signature. They had to wait for the patient to come to the clinic or mail the form to the patient. And they missed the body language if it was a phone only interaction. The clinicians did not have to travel to the dialysis unit to see the patient. It was an opportunity to learn new skill sets, that is to use a platform and to perform a no-touch physical examination. There were fewer missed appointments by the patient and the clinician was able to bill monthly for the visits. The clinicians were able to provide care remotely during the pandemic across state lines. And for the first time, they were able to assess the home environment. Clinician acceptance and uptake continues to be a challenge, especially if there is investment in a platform. In the next few slides, I'd like to um, discuss future considerations with regards to regulatory, what will happen after the public health emergency is lifted? Will we go back to the regulations stated in the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018? And what features of the telehealth under the public health emergency will be adopted? The next few slides have more questions than answers. On the user's front, did telehealth impact clinical outcomes? What are the patient reported outcomes with using telehealth? What are the, tele, what are the healthcare cost savings and efficient uses with telehealth? CMS and evaluation of patient outcomes such as hospitalization and emergency uh, room use rates during the natural experiment during the COVID-19 pandemic will provide answers. In the future, how do we leverage telehealth in designing a virtual home dialysis practice? How do we leverage telehealth to care for the increasing numbers of patients choosing home modalities? The um, uh, Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative and the ETC or end-stage renal disease treatment choice demonstration project will generate more home dialysis patients. What role will telehealth play in educating patients on treatment modalities? What role will telehealth have in patient training and chronic care? On the technology front, what additional refinements can be added to the platforms to meet our needs? When will everyone have access to the internet? When will our phones be able to pick up heart and lung sounds? What role will artificial intelligence play in data management with remote monitoring? And for the stakeholders, there are many stakeholders in a home dialysis program, patients, care partners, family members, dialysis clinic staff, clinicians, dialysis providers, payers, and regulators. If they come together to make telehealth the standard of care for stable patients, that would be ideal. In closing, I'd like to thank the, pers the um, perspectives from home dialysis patients, home dialysis staff, and the members of the ASN COVID-19 Home Dialysis Subcommittee. The members of the Home Dialysis Subcommittee penned a perspective, which will appear in the American Journal of Kidney Diseases. The title is Telehealth for Home Dialysis in COVID-19 and Beyond, a perspective from the American Society of Nephrology COVID-19 Home Dialysis Subcommittee. 
please read the article for additional information on telehealth for home dialysis patients. I thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank the ASN and the organizer for the opportunity to present today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the management of COVID in kidney transplant recipients uh, and what we know so far. These are my disclosures, uh, nothing that's particularly pertinent to uh, the topic at hand. So just to provide some context, as we all know, uh, kidney transplantation was directly impacted by the COVID pandemic, uh, in part because of the concern for the resource uh, conservation, as well as the recognition that we needed to try to keep both our living donors and our recipients safe. So in early March, as you can see from the figures on the right, there was a dramatic drop off in living donor uh, kidney transplantations where we essentially came to a uh, halt across the United States. That has picked up somewhat after a six week hiatus. Uh, it isn't quite back at the same levels it was before the pandemic, but it is continuing to increase. Uh, deceased donor transplants uh, aren't quite as elective as living donor transplants, and so that uh, there wasn't quite the same dramatic drop off, and it certainly didn't stop. It's also a reflect of the fact that the pandemic didn't affect the entire country um, uniformly. Uh, but transplant rates have picked up, but that uh, initial six-week gap has resulted in the fact that uh, deceased donor transplants, and uh, while they have exceeded the rates in 2019, the overall transplantation rate for 2020 is still lags behind that of 2019 at this at the same point last year. So switching to talking about COVID and its actual management, incidence among kidney transplant recipients was... Uh, not well understood uh, till this fresh off the press study from uh, a prospective cohort in Paris. This is a cohort of 1,200 transplant recipients from two transplant centers in Paris that followed their patients from the from early March through the end of April. What they identified was essentially 66 patients among their 1,200 odd patients who went on, approximately 1,200 patients went on to develop COVID. So as you can see from this table. While 5% of the cohort developed COVID, uh, and while that may not seem like a large number, you have to remember that it was the incidence in the general population at that point was 0.3%. So we're talking about more than a 10 fold increase in the incidence of COVID, uh, underscoring what we already know that these are immunosuppressed indi susceptible individuals. So it's not surprising that they would have a higher incidence of COVID-19. Uh, what's notable here, I think, is that racial minorities were at a significantly higher risk. Uh, in their cohort, they also identified risk factors for COVID, COVID infection on a multivariable analysis that identified diabetes, hypertension, obesity, uh, you know, extended dialysis vintage, and the fact that um, patients who are also on maintenance prednisone would appear to be at a um, higher risk of developing COVID than uh, the rest of their cohort. Our Columbia experience, which is uh, also from March showed uh, was somewhat consistent. Uh, what we found was that our patients who presented uh, tended to be male, tended to be older. Uh, the majority of patients were deceased donor recipients, similar to what, what the French or the Paris uh, cohort reported. There was no real dif difference among maintenance immunosuppression, except we also did note that you know about two thirds of our patients were on prednisone. Uh, what's particularly notable about this is that we're a transplant program that does not use uh, steroid immunosuppression normally, except for our uh, most highly sensitized patients. And so, uh, you know, this is somewhat, this stood out when we did our initial analysis. Um, and in terms of clinical presentation, what we found that was that patients also presented uh, similar to the way they would present in the general population, fever, cough, and dyspnea were the most common symptoms. But what was notable was we had patients who were also presenting with isolated GI symptoms, particularly diarrhea, uh, who were then subsequently going to have pulmonary symptoms. The other thing of note that uh, has since been found in other cohorts, both from Italy and Spain, is that about a third of patients at the time of initial presentation uh, do not have any acute chest x-ray findings. In terms of laboratory findings, uh, lymphopenia was common, elevated Biomarkers were 
uh, very common elevated ferritin, LDH growth, calcitonin, ESR, uh, elevated CRPs and interleukin levels were common in the cohort, but the range um, that patients presented with was, was highly variable. And perhaps what was hard about the inflammatory markers in particular was the fact that we didn't see any trends that were particularly informative and certainly didn't help with prognosis. Um, you know, which was disappointing because I think everybody at the time was looking for um, kind of the marker that would help either guide management or provide some prognostic information. Uh, the University of Washington uh, with Olivia Cates put together a fantastic uh, countrywide uh, registry that is, you know, of all solid organ transplant recipients. Uh, they had hundreds and hundreds of patients uh, across the country uh, added to their registry and what they found was something similar where cough, fever, dyspnea were common. Uh, a significant proportion of the patients also had GI symptoms, although they don't report if what proportion of those patients in this cohort presented primarily with GI symptoms. Um, <clears throat> and of course, they also uh, demonstrated that about a quarter of their patients in, in the registry did not have uh, chest x-ray findings at presentation and lymph lymphopenia was, uh, again, a common finding. This is the Tango registry data. This is 12 centers, transplant centers from Italy, Spain, and the United States. They, sh they also showed similar findings, fever, myalgia, dyspnea, common diarrhea was, was a common effect, uh, or common uh, symptom, sorry. And what's notable is that both dyspnea and diarrhea were both associated with the poor outcomes for in this particular cohort. Now, as I said earlier, there was no apparent difference across maintenance immunosuppression in terms of those patients who would go on to uh, develop either severe disease or those people who had the worst prognosis or uh, among non-survivors. What is perhaps, um, you know, so the data above is the, is the Columbia experience across all solid organs, not just kidney. I've already shown you the kidney data. Uh, and this is the Tango registry again, which does not, was not able to find a difference in the pattern of immunosuppression. So there wasn't a particular group that was necessarily more susceptible than not. In terms of outcomes, so among our cohort at Columbia, uh, we had two deaths uh, suggesting about a 15% mortality rate. I would say that's uh, probably at the lower end of the mortality range. Uh, you know, I, I would say, I would argue that, you know, perhaps that uh, a rapid and early cessation of the anti-metabolite may have con contributed and may have been helpful. Uh, but, you know, it, these are small numbers and that's at best conjecture. Um, an early systematic review that was published uh, in infectious diseases that looked at the first 12 single center reports, since that's what was coming out early on, uh, they assembled uh, 12 studies that had included a total of a little over 200 patients. And what they found essentially was about a third of patients were being admitted to the ICU. One in five patients uh, required mechanical ventilation and about, a, you know, uh, the mortality rate was about 20%. And among patients who were on mechanical ventilation, about three, three out of four patients uh, would go on to die, unfortunately, suggesting that mechanical ventilation among Patients with solid organ transplantation and immunosuppression, uh, you know, didn't fare well. The University of Washington registry uh, showed a similar 28-day mortality. Uh, their all-cause mortality for kidney transplant recipients was a little less than 18%, approximately. Um, but what's notable is, again, they showed that four out of five required hospital admission, noting that not every patient with COVID and uh, immunosuppression needed hospitalization. About a third required mechanical uh, required ICU admission, and about a quarter required mechanical ventilation. Uh, the other thing that's quite notable is, despite the fact that most of us are managing our patients with COVID, uh, primarily with immunosuppression reduction, the presence of acute cellular rejections and AMRs was uh, almost absent. So the registry only reported one case uh, at Columbia. I can, uh, we certainly did not detect an uptick in 
the presence of acute cellular or uh, antibody needed rejections despite the fact that we were lowering immunosuppression for our patients. The Tango registry was uh, also showed about um, uh, a much higher mortality rate. They had about a 32% mortality rate in their 144 patients. Uh, lymphopenia at the time of presentation, low GFRs, elevated liver enzymes were all associated with poor outcomes, as was an elevated uh, inflammatory biomarkers and LD8. So elevated IL-6 levels, uh, procalcitonin levels, uh, and LDH levels were all associated with poor outcomes. The Paris cohort of 1,200 patients and uh, in their 66 patients with uh, COVID, they showed a 24% mortality rate. So as, you can see, we're, so as you can see, we're starting to approximate where all of these cohorts are starting to report essentially the same uh, ballpark, which is about between 20 and 25%. Uh, the French solid organ COVID registry uh, followed about 250 hospitalized patients and another about 40 patients as outpatients. And they reported again a 23% mortality rate uh, and reported similar factors that were associated with poor outcomes in their patients. Older patients, diabetics, obese patients, patients who presented with dyspnea on uh, at the time of presentation, and those people who had elevated CRPs and calcitonins all did poorly. Uh, and this is, to be frank, quite consistent with even what we're seeing in the general population. So in some ways, it's reassuring that at least we're being, you know, what we're seeing in our patient population is consistent with the overall message. So in terms of managing patients, um, you know, so as you can see, both the University of Washington, uh, it reported almost uh, a significant proportion of patients, almost 20% of patients were managed as outpatients. Similarly, in the French cohorts, uh, a significant proportion of patients were managed as outpatients. Uh, we did the same at Columbia, and it is possible to do with excellent outcomes. You know, however, what, what's required is careful monitoring of patients, uh, we did self-monitored temperature checks and when possible pulse oximetry. Uh, the idea being that we would follow and track symptoms. We had a peripheralized checklist, so you want to make sure where you're able to recognize uh, changes and deterioration in symptoms over time. Uh, of the patients that we initially started out as managing as outpatients, about a quarter of them eventually needed hospitalizations. Uh, patients who needed hospitalization needed, did so approximately a median of seven days after symptom onset. However, we've had at least one, um, one or two patients who've needed admissions for COVID-related symptoms as far as 15, 16 days out. So it's important to continue to follow these patients when we do so in our patients till there is resolution of symptoms. Uh, the majority of patients will have resolution of symptoms usually within two weeks. Uh, and this is a labor-intensive undertaking, but in, in the setting of a pandemic surge, it's perhaps um, a good use of resources. Uh, it conserves hospitalizations and hospital beds for the sickest of our patients, uh, and it can be done in a manner that allows us to get good outcomes for our patients, uh, but it does require a protocolized approach uh, where with frequent uh, interaction with these patients as frequently as daily in many instances. In terms of our patients who were hospital uh, that we were following as our patients that we eventually hospitalized, dialysis vintage, comorbidities, age, uh, you know, weren't necessarily very, uh, very predictive of uh, or informative of who would eventually need hospitalization. The one thing that did stand out, however, is uh, the presence of dyspnea. So Distinct patients eventually need, ended up needing to be hospitalized more often than those who were not. Um, so outside of managing them as outpatients, so let's talk about medication, their management of their immunosuppression and uh, medications. So this is data again from the University of Washington COVID registry, which, show, which shows essentially that about 70% of patients in the registry ended up getting a modification of their immunosuppression, which is kind of the go-to first step for uh, managing any patient that you suspect of as having COVID or confirmed as having COVID-19. Uh, it's 
as was the case with the majority of patients in the early pandemic, while we were still unsure of whether uh, there was a role for hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin in the management of these patients, half the patients received hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, about a quarter of these patients got azithromycin, and there was a smattering of other treatments that were uh, employed. So certainly, uh, tocilizumab and other IL-6 antagonists, uh, corticosteroids, convalescent plasma, remdesivir, IVIG were all tried, um, all with varied success or lack thereof. So IL-6, uh, you know, antagonist, while thought to be very promising early on, does not appear to have had any effect. Um, if anything, it may have actually made things worse by predisposing patients to increased infections. I know in, in a cohort of all solid organ transplant recipients that we reported from Columbia, there was actually an increase in viral infections in patients who received tocilizumab, uh, which was disappointing, and so we no longer use it in, the, in our cohort. Uh, the other thing that I think stands out here is this, that uh, the inability for, for us as a, as a community to have enrolled these patients in clinical trials. So as you can see from this figure in the last column on the right, very few patients actually ended up in any clinical trials, um, which I think limits our ability in the long term to understand how to manage these patients effectively. So in other factors in terms of management, uh, there is an excellent review it's an expert opinion uh, and review of the literature uh, published in NDT from the uh, from Europe that basically describes um, you know what what is what can be best described as good expert opinion recommendations. Uh, I, I would argue that they're good common sense recommendations that we should be using for our patients uh, and uh, employing them uh, consistently so we can develop an understanding of of how to manage these patients moving. So I've essentially summarized their recommendations here. So what they say is for asymptomatic patients with no risk factors, there's no real need to change immunosuppression other and just need to follow these patients uh, and monitor them for the potential for development of symptoms. For those individuals who have uh, risk factors, particularly those who are elderly, uh, obese, or have uh, significant comorbidities, particularly diabetes and hypertension, a one-step reduction of immunosuppressions, i.e. the uh, reduction of antimetabolites by 50%, is a reasonable first step, uh, and then you can follow those patients up. For those individuals who are symptomatic, if you have mild symptoms, you can be followed as an outpatient. One-step reduction with close monitoring is probably the preferred route. Uh, you have to follow these patients closely to make sure that if you uh, don't have complete resolution of symptoms or there's a progression of symptoms, then we should consider cutting the antimetabolite out completely. Now, for those people who have moderate symptoms, we would recommend uh, ces cessation of antimetabolite completely, and then early hospitalization for those individuals who appear to have progressive symptoms, particularly dyspnea for close observation. Um, and consider the use of uh, corticosteroids um, and the further lowering of uh, calcium urine inhibitors uh, and of course, the lowering of calcium urine inhibitors, given that the patients are going to be on monotherapy, has to be balanced with the immunologic risk, uh, you know, that you that you have at hand. Understanding, though, that you know the risk of rejection among patients with COVID seems relatively low. So, uh, despite the fact that you know we've been able, there are many many reports. Most of it is observational. Uh, we have developed some understanding of how to manage these patients, but many, many questions remain. So uh, we don't have a good understanding of risk mitigation strategies beyond what, what we'd recommend for the general population. Uh, we don't know what's the ideal time to increase immunosuppression for these patients uh, once they have recovered from the COVID or the resolution of symptoms. Uh, the absence of rejections detected does not necessarily equal the absence of acute rejections entirely, uh, whether rejections are being masked by the presence of acute kidney injury and what we're ascribing to ATN, particularly for patients in the ICUs, is unclear. Um, these patients are certainly not getting biopsies in the midst of their um, COVID infections, uh, at least not frequently, as 
as frequently as we did earlier. Uh, for those patients who are getting transplanted at this point in time, the risks associated with induction therapy uh, is remains unclear. Uh, and like I said earlier, the potential role for CNI mTOR inhibition uh, in preventing this uh, progression of disease is also unclear. So in summary, uh, what I've shown you is that the clinical presentation of kidney transplant recipients with COVID is very similar to that of uh, the general population. So fever and cough are common. Isolated diarrhea is, uh, is a symptom that should not be overlooked. And risk factors for poor prognosis include uh, old age, uh, men appear to do worse, obese individuals with comorbidities, particularly hypertension and diabetes. Um, the signal around prednisone is confusing. Uh, you know, it's clear that there is a higher incidence of COVID-19 among patients with immunosuppressive regimens include um, prednisone. However, there's also now uh, compelling evidence to suggest that corticosteroids are associated with improved outcomes uh, for those individuals with symptomatic COVID-19. Um, so more needs, to, more information and more data is needed before we can have a better understanding of what this actually means. Primary strategy for treatment at this point is a prompt reduction of immunosuppression once you have COVID-19 and are symptomatic, uh, starting with a reduction of the anti-metabolite. In particular, given that there is, uh, there are questions about the potential value of either calcineurin inhibitors or mTOR inhibitors in the management of COVID-19, so I certainly wouldn't recommend eliminating those as a first step. Uh, COVID-19 in this patient population appears to be associated with an approximately 20% mortality rate, which seems reasonably consistent across um, most cohorts. Uh, granted that there is some variation, some cohorts have reported uh, mortality rates as low as 7, 7 to 10%, uh, while others have reported a mortality rate as high as 35%, but both of those are relatively extreme and uncommon. The risk of rejection appears to be very low when it is reported in these uh, series, um, you know, which is, which is, I think, an interesting finding and should alleviate some of the concerns associated with immunosuppression reduction when we see patients with COVID-19. And outpatient management of mildly asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic patients, sorry, is an effective strategy um, as long as it's coupled with close follow-up of patients given that nearly a quarter of these patients will eventually require hospitalization. But for the three quarters of patients that do not require hospitalization, it's probably an effective um, strategy that is, uh, you know, is certainly less intimidating for them. And with that, I will stop. Thank you again for the opportunity and want to acknowledge both our funders uh, and a research team at Columbia that helped put, a lot, helped put a lot of our Columbia data together. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Many thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak at Kidney Week. These are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to this talk. We're still confronting the many challenges of COVID-19 as it continues to exist throughout the world and be especially prevalent in the United States, where over 7 million individuals have become infected, and we account for 20% of the world's mortality due to COVID-19. The stakes are especially high for solid organ transplant recipients, including those who have received kidney transplants. It's notable that many kidney recipients have comorbidities associated with worse outcomes, including hypertension, diabetes mellitus, obesity, and underlying cardiac and pulmonary diseases. They're at risk for significant complications, including acute kidney injury, pneumonia with and without respiratory failure, liver injury, and cardiovascular and thromboembolic events. It's hard to know exactly what the mortality is, as the focus has been on hospitalized patients in whom mortality has been reported to be between 18 and 32 percent. We recognize, however, that the community-acquired cases sometimes don't come to medical attention and may be undercounted. What can we tell our patients now, especially as the world is opening up? 
and they try to balance the demands of their daily life with measures to maintain their safety? This is very challenging for providers because the information stream keeps changing. As of September 16th, there were over 55,000 publications about SARS-CoV searchable on PubMed. Epidemiology, prevention strategies and recommendations, testing strategies, and recommendations for treatment and treatment efficacy keeps changing. And so this changes the advice we give our patients. Although there are certainly reports of transplant experience in the literature, there's actually very little transplant specific information to guide our recommendations relative to that of the general public. In addition, we must appreciate that daily media reports are infused with political biases, which leads to confusion and potential increased mistrust of those of us who are supposed to be trusted professionals. So what can we do? First, we have to understand the actual epidemiology of SARS-CoV and how it's changed over time. If we look at the map on the left, this is the total cases reported in the United States of SARS-CoV as of September 2020. You'll notice that there are hot spots, for example, in the northeastern United States, where the caseload was quite high. Notably, this reflects early acquisition of infection in the spring of 2020. And if you were to look at the map on the right, which is the current caseload and prevalence in the United States, you'll notice that many of those areas that were dark red in the left-hand map have actually lightened in color, reflecting lower case numbers at this current time. And so it's important to know what the epidemiology is in the area where you're practicing and where your patients live. But we can't think of this just on a state-by-state -state basis because the true risk lies in regional exposure, which is fueled by local events, for example, the opening of colleges. So understanding individual risk requires knowledge of local epidemiology, and we must appreciate that socioeconomic factors play a role because of some of our most vulnerable communities are the communities at greatest risk for infection with SARS-CoV-2. Additionally, in order for us to advise our patients, we need to understand the risk of acquisition. Remember, the portal of entry of this virus is mucous membranes, including the mouth, nose, and eyes. While we think donor-derived infection could occur, it has not yet been described. Now, transmission of COVID-19 is most closely associated with droplet spread. That's why we talk about six-foot distancing, because droplets really don't travel that far. But we must appreciate that there are other ways that one could get COVID and aerosol transmission is possible, although certainly not the main mode. And really the greatest risk occurs in aerosol generating events. Inanimate objects have been contaminated by this virus and pets have become infected, but these do not appear to be significant modes of transmission and we do not have special advice for managing pets and for inanimate objects daily hygiene really seems to be the most important thing with frequent cleaning of high touch surfaces. Importantly, there's no evidence that climate or temperature affects the risk of transmission so we can't look forward to hotter or colder days to prevent infection. Here are the basics. I think we've all seen this schematic from the CDC and from other sources. We want to recommend that patients and ourselves avoid touching the eyes, nose, and mouth. Masks will help us do that. We also recommend frequent hand washing with soap and water or waterless hand gel. Social distancing is essential and people should cover their coughs and sneezes, not with their hands, but with their sleeves or elbows. 
Cleaning and disinfecting high-touch surfaces is critical to preventing spread from inanimate objects, and everyone should be monitoring themselves for symptoms and staying away from others if they develop new symptoms. Masking turns out to be very useful as well. I want to dispel any thoughts that masks don't make a difference. We need only look at this one CDC experience to show how important they can be. In this case, two hairdressers actually worked sick, but they worked with masks and their customers also wore masks. And in a CDC analysis of, of 104 clients of two hairstylists working sick, they were able to demonstrate no transmission of SARS-CoV despite the close contact for at least 15 minutes. So what do masks do? Well, they probably do a couple of things. They're mostly protecting the spread of SARS-CoV from the infected patient to others when that person wears a mask. The face mask clearly decreases the inoculum of virus that's expelled into the environment, decreasing the likelihood of asymptomatic exposure when individuals almost certainly have lower inocula and it may decrease the development of symptomatic disease by exposing individuals to a much lower inoculum. We do need to appreciate that not all face masks are equal, and while clearly N95 and surgical masks perform best, many homemade masks work well. The masks, however, to be avoided are those made out of bandanas and the neck gaiters, which have both been shown to be higher risk masks in terms of protecting others. So what mask is the right one? Well, it should have at least two or more layers of washable, breathable fabric and completely cover the nose and mouth and fits snugly across the sides of the face without gaps. It's very important that people not use vinyl masks, which make it hard to breathe, or masks with exhalation valves or vents because those allow viral particles to escape. N95s can certainly prevent spread of infection, but remember that these are still in limited supply and not essential for use. And if your patient is going to wear an N95, they really have to be taught to wear it appropriately. And so there is a learning curve with using those masks. Interestingly, eye protection may also be an additional source to protect people especially if they're going to be exposed to aerosols when eyes are the more may be more significant as a portal of entry. We don't routinely recommend face shields, but if they are going to be used, they can be worn, especially for protection against aerosols. Here, Megan Morales is exhibiting two types of face masks. The one provided in the hospital is on the upper uh, corner, but she actually was able to make a homemade face mask by attaching um, a non-porous material to the cap of a baseball cap. Interestingly, daily wearers of eyeglasses may have a decreased risk of COVID-19 acquisition, as demonstrated by a study in China, where they showed that a lower proportion of patients hospitalized were those wearing eyeglasses on a daily basis. There hasn't been a prospective trial of this, however. What should we tell our patients who are eager to return to work and or whose household contacts must return to work? I think it's important that we consider whether or not working from home is an option as it's very clearly the safest way to work by limiting contact with others in close quarters. If they can work from home, or if you can provide a letter to allow them to work from home, this would be advisable. But if not, they really need to understand the specifics of their workplace. Certainly, they want to work in an environment where masking is mandatory. And if not, that should be instituted to protect them. There need to be the opportunities to have local hygiene measures, especially if there are shared high-touch surfaces, which need to be frequently cleaned and disinfected. Ideally, they need to be able to maintain social distancing, so working in close quarters in a single poorly ventilated room would not be a good suggestion to allow. <laughs>
they also need to have a safe place to eat. It's very clear that eating in close quarters has been a way that SARS-CoV-2 has, has spread. And every workplace must have a plan for identifying and managing infected workers that will not put them in contact with those who were well. What about returning to schools? Well, there's no question that school environments have been associated with outbreaks. In this one university setting, you can see that when in-person classes started, the case rate of COVID-19 increased dramatically. Once they transitioned to online, eventually the cases went down, but you have to recognize that this may take a little bit of time to actually extinguish the cases acquired from that in-person learning. What about child care facilities? There's no question that there have been some outbreaks associated with child care facilities where a single infected individual can spark the, de spark the development of infection in both other caregivers or in children in the setting. But what's important to know is it's not just the individuals in the daycare setting that actually will be at risk for infection. Often people can bring this infection home, either if they are symptomatic or asymptomatic. And we need to recognize that childcare facilities could be the source of a local community outbreak. So what can we do? The issue of return to school has certainly been a a hot topic in I think pretty much every community at this point as we all try to figure out how best to educate and care for our children. As I said before, students and staff may spread infection to other community members and how safe it is to go to school or a community child setting is depends on the local level of infection. If you're in, in an area where there's virtually no SARS-CoV infection, then you might be able to do in-person learning with relatively low risk. But if you're in a community where the case load is higher, certainly going into a group child care or school setting is going to be more hazardous. So decisions regarding in-person schooling for patients and for household contacts of those patients must consider the local epidemiology and what the safeguards of the school will be, as well as for providing transportation to and from the school. Is there an opportunity for social distancing, including at meal and snack times? Are there universal masking policies? And remember that the recommendations are that everyone aged two years and older should be masked. What are the hygiene practices, especially for things like high touch surfaces? What are the protocols for managing sick students and for quarantining people who may have been exposed? If there are no answers to these questions, then in-person learning or childcare may not be the right uh, answer for your patients or their family members. So you must consider what the feasibility is for virtual options for those patients and their family members. Well, we've all been isolated for a long time, and I think the biggest question for many of our patients is whether or not there's any safe way to meet in person. Very clearly, the answer is the safest thing is to meet outside. So as the weather gets cooler in many parts of the United States, we want to consider warm clothing and outdoor heaters and maintaining social distancing. If there's going to be no aerosolization, and you're able to stay six feet apart or more, you may even be able to take off your mask if you remain distant. We're coming up to a lot of holiday times and people certainly are thinking about getting together in larger groups for family gathering. This can be dangerous and there have certainly been outbreaks attached to family gatherings such as weddings or large communal meals. And so I still would recommend that we emphasize gathering in small, trusted circles. In other words, individuals who you see on a regular basis. And for those larger groups, trying to maintain contact in a more virtual environment. What about for our patients who want to travel? 
Well, this is my checklist based on recommendations from the CDC. Please consider for your patients whether the travel is absolutely necessary. They need to understand what the local risks are with the planned destination. Is this an area where there's a lot of COVID-19 or where COVID-19 has been well controlled? How are they going to get there? Certainly taking personal cars are much safer than public transportation. But if they don't have a personal car to take and must rely on air, train, or bus travel, they need to think about what the options are that will allow for the most social distancing and the fewest exposures. This may mean choosing an option that doesn't require changes in transportation. If they're staying overnight, they need to think about what the accommodations will be for that overnight stay. Are they staying in a family room, family home, or are they staying in an apartment rental or a hotel? They need to know what the ability is to social distance wherever they're going to be staying. What will the options be for eating wherever they go? Will they be required to eat in a crowded dining room or will they be able to maintain social distancing or eat outside when they're going to be dining? They also should know what the rules and regulations are for quarantining where they're traveling to or upon their return because this may also affect their ability to travel. We're coming into election time and for some elections have already started. How can we vote most safely? Well, there's no question that mail-in or absentee ballots are the safest way to vote, but they may not be an option or even preferred for some individuals. If possible, we recommend voting early in person and figuring out the least crowded time in all cases, the patient should wear a mask, bring hand sanitizer in their own individual pen, and try to socially distance to the best of their ability. If they must vote day of in person, they should again figure out the least crowded time, wear their mask, bring a hand sanitizer and their own pen, and socially distance to the best of their ability. What if your patient has been exposed to somebody with with COVID-19? Well, what does exposure mean? We basically say exposure means spending 15 minutes within six feet of a person with confirmed COVID-19 infection. If they've had this significant contact within two days prior to the onset of symptoms in the index case, you should consider testing your patient including doing PCR testing, preferably rather than antigen testing. Do not use an antibody to test for active infection. And remember, if they've just had the exposure, an early test may underestimate the development of SARS-CoV-2 infection in your patient. It takes a few days to actually develop infection and may take as long as 14 days post-contact. During that time, if at all possible, while waiting to figure out if they've developed infection, it's best if they can stay home and away from others to avoid secondary spread of the infection. They should be told to monitor their symptoms, monitor for symptoms, including any variety, including fevers, chills, shortness of breath, upper respiratory tract infections, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and loss of sense of taste and smell. If they develop symptoms, they must be advised advised to be in contact with the transplant center to assess the severity and be given advice on how best to monitor and to seek medical attention when necessary. If they have symptoms, ideally you would like to test them for infection to confirm that that's actually what's going on. And again, PCR is preferred to antigen testing and antibody is not an acceptable way to test for active infection. Quarantine at the minimum is required. If they're asymptomatic or with acute symptoms, they should be quarantining and for at least 10 days since the symptom onset or the positive test. Now we know that transplant patients are at risk of having prolonged carriage and shedding of this virus. And so if possible, you might want to consider retesting them before releasing them into the general public. 
but certainly they must continue to mask even after they become asymptomatic and past 10 days. They should definitely avoid unnecessary, unmonitored healthcare exposures, and so any travel or contact with the healthcare system must be done with preparation. Remember that the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 infection takes time, and initially viral load will rise and then be decreased with the presence of the development of T-cell and antibody response. With time, however, the immune response may decline. And we know that having had COVID-19 does not prevent the possibility of reinfection as documented in this initial report from Hong Kong, where asymptomatic airport screening revealed a new superinfection. We're hopeful that vaccine will help us in the future. There are multiple vaccines in clinical trials now, but none involve live virus and so therefore will ultimately be safe, we think, for immunosuppressed patients. Unfortunately, the trials don't include the immunosuppressed patients, and we know when vaccines become available, the supply will likely be limited, and so we're not sure what the general availability will be. We also don't know what the likelihood and durability of response will be for our patients and whether any transplant-specific risks may occur and what the uptake in the general population will be to prevent this in our patients. We don't know we're coming on the usual influenza season, and while influenza was certainly lower in the southern hemisphere related to social distancing with SARS-CoV, we have no idea what's going to happen in the United States. And so it's very important at this time to make sure that all of our patients are vaccinated for influenza. And so there's a strong recommendation for patients, household contacts, and the general population to be vaccinated with the injectable flu vaccine if they're age six months or higher. So we're not out of the woods yet. And in the meantime, we all need to try to limit the impact of SARS-CoV-2 on our patients, on the healthcare workers, and on the world in general. Please encourage your patients to follow preventive guidelines be attentive to the changing epidemiology in your own world and locality. Continue to closely monitor those at risk and test and quarantine those with symptoms and those at risk of asymptomatic infection. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, please feel free to email me at that email address. Additionally, I just want to put in a plug for the resources posted to the AST website, which have continually updated SARS-CoV infection for the general transplant population and providers. Thank you. Hello, my name is Glenda Roberts, and I'm the Director of External Relations and Patient Engagement for the Kidney Research Institute and the Center for Dialysis Innovation at the University of Washington. But more important, for this presentation, I am a person living with kidney disease. I'm a kidney transplant recipient, and I have experience with peritoneal and hemodialysis. And I want to share with you my experience as a patient during the COVID-19 pandemic. These are my disclosures. Now, my experience with self-isolation began a little bit before most of the rest of the country. In January, I was invited to attend an international meeting in Vancouver, Canada. And my husband was apprehensive about me going because we had started to hear about COVID-19 spreading in China and in Europe. But I assured him that this meeting of international participants would be primarily healthcare professionals and patients with suppressed immune system are living with kidney disease, and they were as committed to maintaining optimum health as I was. I returned from Vancouver and I was fine. The following week, I went to a meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we focused on APL1. In the last day of the meeting, which was early February, there was a tornado. Now, I've lived in the South a long time, and I don't ever recall having a tornado at the beginning of February. So this should have been an omen. We ended the meeting 
and we went to the airport. And after six hours, the airline notified us that our flight had been canceled and they would have to reschedule us for the next day. So we stood outside in the rain for two hours while we waited for our car service to pick us up. We finally got to a hotel at one o'clock in the morning. And by 5.30 the next morning, we were back in the airport. That was less than four hours of sleep. By the time I got home, I was already starting to suffer the effects of a cold. And because I had such a terrible cold, and I, I felt horrible, but I sounded even worse, I decided that it would be better for me to work at home because there are other people in my environment that are immune compromised, and I didn't want to expose my colleagues to my cold. So from February 6th through the end of January, I was home, or February, I was home because I had a cold. On February 29th, the first U.S. reported death was reported in Kirkland, Washington. Kirkland, Washington is the city that is adjacent to where I live. And because of my affiliation with the kidney disease community, I knew that these first two patients were dialysis patients, or in other words, people living with kidney disease like me. They lived in a facility that was very near my local grocery store. So I immediately sounded the alarm at work and in the kidney patient community to be wary of COVID-19. And I have to tell you, people were responding like I was overreacting. I had both patients and healthcare providers tell me, you're very unlikely to get it. I wouldn't worry about it. But I ignored them because I know that I have a suppressed immune system and being immune compromised, I'm more likely to contract a disease or a virus than other people are. And COVID-19 was dynamic and evolving. We were learning new things every day. So my family and I decided that I would self-isolate with my husband. We talked with my only son and his wife, and we explained to them that they would not be able to have contact with me until there was either a treatment or a virus or the pandemic had ended. We stocked up on the essentials. My son and his wife went to the drugstore and got me a 30-day supply of transplant medication so that I would have extra coverage in case of some calamity. We stocked up on food and we got a water system. Even though we ordered water, we also got a water system so that if it became necessary for us to purify water that came from the tap, we would be able to do it because water is so important to my health. And we also got all of the necessary household essentials and everything was delivered. We had it delivered. They put it out on the front porch. We let it sit out there for 24 hours. And then my husband would put on gloves and go out and use strong disinfectants. And we would leave them out for another six hours before we brought them into the house. We also took additional actions to protect my family during the pandemic. We posted a sign on the front door that looked like this, that said that someone in our house has a weak immune system. So if you're feeling sick, don't come in. Or if you knock and we don't answer, leave the package at the door. What this means is that nobody gets in. We also posted signs in our backyard because we have a very friendly community and it was not uncommon for our neighbors to come over to the backyard. And we posted signs at both of the entrances that said private property, no trespassing. And we did that because we wanted our neighbors to be sensitive to my health condition. Since I used the backyard to get a lot of my exercise, we didn't want people coming into the backyard when perhaps I wouldn't have a mask on, and we didn't want them to come with or without a mask. I started working from home exclusively. I eliminated all travel, and we are vigilant about cleaning and disinfecting all surfaces. I know that the guidance is that we should stay six feet apart and not gather into large groups. But if you look on the CDC site, there's actually a report of some research that was done in China where they found that droplets could travel as much as 13 feet. 
because my husband is an engineer, we did some research on fluid dynamics, and we found a report that said that when people sneeze or cough forcefully, those droplets can go up to 27 feet. So my rule is, unless you're my nephrologist or my phlebotomist, then you need to stay at least 27 feet away from me. And friends have been very supportive, but they've asked to come over and visit, or they ask that we come and visit them. And we always have to decline. We try and explain that I am at unusual risk because of my health status. But we assure them, as soon as there's a vaccine or some other treatment, they're welcome to come over and we'll be coming to visit them. Being at high risk for COVID-19, as I am, according to the list on the left, is very scary. But I've talked to a number of kidney transplant recipients, and they assure me that returning to work is scarier because they have to depend on their colleagues to be vigilant in terms of hygiene and social distancing, not just at work, but when they return home or when they're in other settings, because we are afraid of contracting COVID-19. Now, COVID-19 is emotionally and physically stressful, but rather than focus on the stress of COVID-19, I decided to focus on what I could control. So I maintain routines and rituals. My routine from Monday to Friday is I get up every day, I get completely dressed. I put on everything from earrings to shoes as though I was leaving the house for work before I sit down to my computer to either read my mail or participate in webinars and Zoom calls. I've also added a lot more work to my already heavy burden. I've joined the ASN COVID-19 response team, and I'm also a member of the transplant subcommittee. I am the only patient representative on both of those entities. I have joined the EGFR and race task force that is sponsored by NKF and ASN. That's the National Kidney Foundation. And I've participated in several ASN webinars. One of them focuses on mental health during COVID-19. And while most of the presenters are healthcare professionals, I also present it because what we find is that healthcare professionals and patients are all experiencing some of the same symptoms that are associated with mental health during this pandemic. And we propose actions that patients and providers could take to assume to assure their optimal mental, mental health. I also participated in a webinar that dealt with uh, diabetic kidney disease. And I talked about how patients could participate in research because one of the things we know about kidney disease is that the people who participate in research don't necessarily reflect the people with kidney disease. And so I sought to educate people about internal review boards, patient advisory boards, community engagement committees that are all participating with researchers to ensure that patients are protected and that the interests of patients are being looked out for. And I did something new. I have never authored or co-authored any publication that was associated with kidney disease prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the June-July timeframe, one of my colleagues, who is also a kidney transplant recipient who had experience with COVID-19, wrote a paper entitled The Early Days, where we outlined what we were experiencing as patients both with COVID-19 and without COVID-19, and we communicated to the kidney community what we needed in order to best support us. I had another opportunity during this period to also write a paper in Nature Reviews Nephrology about kidney precision medicine with two other kidney transplant recipients and a person living with kidney disease. Those were very rewarding because it gave us an opportunity to share our perspective about the groundbreaking research that is going on with the Kidney Precision Medicine Project. And I participated in a number of other national and international 
publications, one of which is still in review. Now, one of the things that I learned at GE when I was in product development was that if you can't fix it, feature it. So rather than complaining about the Zoom calls and the webinars and the go-to-meeting meetings, I've decided to have fun with Zoom. I have scheduled regular mocktail hours with at least four of my friends that we meet once a month, and we spend an hour, and I drink cranberry juice or cherry juice, and they drink whatever they're drinking because I don't drink alcohol, and we just spend the time chilling and having a good time and talking about the positive things that are happening in our lives because it's easy to dwell on the challenges of being isolated or not being able to engage with colleagues but if we can focus on new hobbies or new things that we're doing then it's uplifting and you look forward to having that conversation so one of my friends and i meet every friday at 5 15 and we're supposed to talk for one hour and we always talk three to four hours. Both of us have hired a Zoom personal trainer that we meet with twice a week, so we get to moan and groan about what hurts, and I joined a Zoom yoga class. This is my first time doing yoga, and so it's really been really interesting and exciting, and I found out that there's some things that need to be stretched out. My husband has graciously moved our weight set from the exercise room out to the basketball court so that I'm not doing all of my exercise inside. I spend a lot of time walking outside in the lawn, walking around the house, but also making sure that I'm getting all of the necessary steps on my treadmill that I have behind me. And I have invited a number of other people to participate in uh, Fitbit competitions with me so that, you know, it gives me a lot of different variety and a lot of different things that I'm doing, and I'm not focusing on the limitations of COVID-19. One of the most fun things I'm doing that I used to do before we had all this technology is to curl up with a good book. I love reading paperback and hardcover books, and I choose not to use my Kindle or my iPad for that because I use technology so much for work and in these exercise programs and in these mocktail hours, I really needed a way to get away from the technology. And reading a paperback book is the perfect way to do that. And of course, I continue to focus on ways to maintain my optimum health. For us, maintaining optimum health means doing many of the things that I'm sure you're doing in terms of wearing masks, washing our, hand, washing our hands, and using hand sanitizer. But on a regular basis, I will be on a meeting and my husband will walk by and say, stop touching that, meaning take your hands out of your face. We know that one of the ways that people contract COVID-19 is by touching surfaces where the COVID virus, excuse me, has landed. And so by practicing, even though nobody's coming into our house and we're diligent about cleaning, it is important for me to get in the habit of not touching my face so that once I am back out into the community, I will be practicing the safest practices to maintain optimum health and we're having kidney-friendly meals. I continue to take my transplant medication on a regular basis. I have even gotten a flu shot, and I am afraid of needles. And I'm making sure that I get enough sleep because I understand that sleep is important, not only for my kidneys, but also just maintaining good health. I've reached out to some of my other kidney transplant recipients to get their perspective on what's going on in their lives. And I'd like to read some of their quotations to you. My friends and some family are out doing things and I rarely hear from them at all. I feel like I'm the only one doing something wrong by staying home, if that makes sense. The biggest challenge during this pandemic is feeling the same level of isolation and rejection I felt when I was first diagnosed with kidney disease. Face-to-face -face interactions, traveling, and the gym are my main coping strategies, so I'm finding suitable alternatives. 
Who would have thought that a mask would become so political? Before COVID, if you wore a mask, people perceived that you had something instead of being viewed as a protective mechanism for the wearer. Now that we're all required to wear a mask, the constitutionality of a person's health is in play. Crazy. It bothers me. Fellow kidney patients are not adhering to the guidelines, especially ambassadors and advocates. Others see that and think it's okay for them to take the same risk and could end up catching the virus. Now, as you know, COVID-19 starts like many other illnesses, and the typical patient symptoms are fever, cough, sore throat, fatigue, muscle aches, headaches, and sudden loss of smell, taste, and shortness of breath. However, some research has surfaced that indicates that dialysis patients often don't start with a fever. And so people who are going to dialysis centers may have a false sense of security because they're getting their temperatures taken as they come into the facility. They're asked to wear masks, but you know, People want to wear them on the chins and pull down and not really be as safe as they need to. So I encourage you to read the paper, Long-Term Hemodialysis During the COVID-19 Pandemic, because it talks about how dialysis patients are manifesting different symptoms than the typical COVID-19 patient. We are also concerned in the kidney community uh, what, about the long-term effects for what are known as COVID-19 long haulers. Long haulers include people with kidney disease, and these people continue to suffer even after they have a negative COVID-19 test. So in theory, they have recovered from COVID-19, but months after the recovery, they continue to, su to suffer with a number of diseases in terms of lung damage, crushing fatigue, and other symptoms. I mentioned earlier that one of my colleagues and I wrote a paper about COVID-19, and he was first diagnosed with COVID-19 on March 15th. At the beginning of April, he was symptom-free. However, through September 30th, he continues to experience myriad symptoms like fatigue, brain fog, swelling of the veins in his legs, periodic numbness, and I can personally attest to mood changes and changes in his disposition occasionally. Dr. Francis Collins reported in his podcast on September 3rd about citizen scientists who were doing research on long haul COVID-19. If you have not heard the podcast, I encourage you to listen to it. And what these long haulers are doing, because there is no research right now, is they have developed a detailed patient survey where they are asking people about the symptoms that they're experiencing and the duration of those symptoms to try to give healthcare professionals some insight into what's going on. And what is sorely needed is some scientific driven research around COVID-19 and what is necessary to help these patients recover. Because we know that even people who don't have kidney disease, when they get COVID-19, frequently they get acute kidney injury. So research around COVID-19, research around people with kidney disease who are long haulers is increasingly important. Now, the current state of things is that there is an avalanche of ever-evolving information around COVID-19. You'll read a research paper this month that says, here's what we know about COVID-19. Two months later, the same researchers will publish a different report that says, we have different information and our thinking has evolved. We all understand that COVID-19 is novel, that it's new, and that everybody is learning, both healthcare professionals and patients. We know that there are no cures and there are no vaccines. And healthcare professionals are reluctant to educate us about what they do know. We understand that healthcare professionals like to say, you have this condition, we want you to take 
this action or this treatment or this medication. We know that there are no medications or treatments at this point in time, but we do need to have you give us your best understanding of where things currently stand. And as patients, almost all patients I know are capable of dealing with the dynamic and changing information. Historically, there's been a dearth of sources of information for transplant patients. And we're starting to see more and more information for transplant patients, but we still aren't seeing enough information for kidney transplant specific information about COVID-19. We need to identify trusted sources of information and we're relying on you to provide that for us. We need your guidance. Give us your best guess. We understand that People are getting new information and that information is evolving. But too often, people are reaching out to me, asking me what we should do as transplant recipients. And I explain to them that I'm not a doctor and I'm not a researcher in the traditional sense and that they should contact the transplant centers or their nephrologists. And what we find is that transplant centers are reluctant to tell people anything because they can't give them answers. And what we ask is that you explain what you know so far. I encourage people to go to the CDC's site because they provide general guidance, but what we need is more information to help long haulers with the available research that you have and recommended strategies, and we need more kidney-specific information for people living with kidney disease who are kidney transplant recipients. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues at the Center for Dialysis Innovation and the Kidney Research Institution, ASN, and all of the individuals who have contributed to the development of this presentation and who are helping me live during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And by the way, contact me if you wanna do a Fitbit challenge. Thank you very much. My name is Jeffrey Pearl, and I'm moderating this session with Dr. Krista Lentine. I'm a nephrologist from St. Michael's Hospital, University of Toronto. There's some very important take-home points in this clinical practice session, adapting practice to a pandemic focused on home dialysis and kidney transplantation. In the first lecture, Dr. Edwina Brown made a compelling argument for the important role that peritoneal dialysis may play during the COVID-19 pandemic. She also talked about important barriers and considerations uh, that re represent major obstacles in terms of increasing home dialysis utilization during COVID-19 and beyond. Followed by Dr. Brown's lecture, Dr. Liu talked to us about the important role that telemedicine is playing in providing virtual care for our patients receiving home dialysis during the COVID-19 pandemic. This represents exciting opportunities to expand the use of telemedicine beyond COVID-19, and Dr. Liu so eloquently articulated some of the barriers, challenges, and future directions, and the important role that engagement with the multidisciplinary team plays. We also heard from Dr. Sumit Mohan regarding the epidemiology and outcomes of kidney transplant recipients with COVID-19. There's some important, valuable take-home points in terms of how kidney transplant patients present with COVID-19 and their outcomes. And extending upon Dr. Mohan's lecture was Dr. Bloomberg, who talked to us about important preventative strategies for COVID-19 in the kidney transplant population, particularly focusing on the important roles of the influenza vaccine and highlighting what role the COVID-19 vaccine would play and what that would look like in the kidney transplant population. And lastly, but not least, we heard about a patient's pandemic journey. Dr. Uh, Glenda Roberts so eloquently talked to us about some of the struggles that our patients are facing during the COVID-19 pandemic. The stresses, the anxiety, um, the challenges, the need to access up-to-date and credible information. But Glenda also so eloquently highlighted some of the many strategies that our patients can take to come out of COVID-19 stronger and more resilient.